We are now going to start an overview of Chapter 6, which dealt with nucleophilic substitution reactions. And in this section, we have a nucleophile, we have our substrate, in which is attached our leaving group, and you substitute nucleophile for the leaving group. In this case, our substrate is mainly alkyl halides, and therefore X was a halogen, and you need to be able to characterize these alkyl halides as primary, secondary, tertiary, methyl, meaning you have no R groups attached, or neopental. And remember that neopental had a leaving group that was next to, the leaving group's attached to a carbon that's next to a quaternary carbon. And keep in mind also that alkyl halides, the carbon that your X is attached to has to be sp3. It cannot be sp2 and it cannot be sp. And if you see an sp2 or sp halogen, you ignore it. Only these types can take place in the reactions that we discussed in this chapter. So let's start with the first type of nucleophilic addition reaction, which was SN2. And we'll go over the factors for that. So SN2. Some key terms. It's concerted. This means it occurs in one step. It's bimolecular, meaning two molecules are reacting in the transition state of our slow step, and it's second order, and that's where the two comes from, okay? Substitution, nucleophilic, second order. So let's draw an SN2 reaction. We have a nucleophile. And let's say we have this alkyl halide, so this would be a secondary alkyl bromide. And we'll draw the mechanism arrows in red, and so the nucleophile attacks, displacing the leaving group. And so mechanism will be in red. This occurs all at once and in the presence of a solvent. The nucleophile attacks from the opposite side of the bromine, and so since the bromine was in front, the nucleophile will be in the back, and our bromine is now a leaving group called bromide. So the stereo center here is inverted, and this is known as backside attack. So if our stereocenter was R, it would now be S. Okay. If we want to draw the transition state for this reaction, remember that the transition state has dotted lines to show bond breaking and bond forming. And our slowest step is our rate determining step, so RDS. The slow step determines the rate law. And since we only have one step, this is the slow step, and both the nucleophile and the substrate are involved at the same time. Okay, so whatever molecules are involved here, determines your rate law. And so the rate equals K times nucleophile times substrate. So both molecules, nucleophile and substrate, are in the rate determining step. And so overall it's second order because each of these are first order. 
And so overall, when you add them together, it's a second order reaction. What this is telling you is if you double the concentration of the nucleophile, you will double the rate. If you triple the concentration of the nucleophile, you will triple the rate, and so on. So let's draw the energy diagram for this reaction, and I'm going to erase this. Okay, so the energy diagram needs to reflect the fact that the reaction proceeds as drawn. So the reaction is downhill. It's one step. This is our energy on the y-axis, and this is our reaction coordinate on the x-axis. If we label some things on here, the top is the transition state, which is the highest energy point, and we start at reactants, and we end at products. The energy barrier that you need to overcome is delta G dagger, so this is the energy barrier or also known as the energy of activation. And then overall, the energy of the reaction, if you draw dotted lines from the reactants to the products, this difference in energy, delta G, is delta G of the reaction. And since we went downhill, it's negative. And that was known as exergonic. So these are important points to know from the energy diagram. And so if we want to speed up the rate of an SN2 reaction and we want this to go faster, we need to lower this energy. Okay? So faster rate equals lower energy of the transition state. Okay. And so for SN2, we talked about what those factors were. We want an unhindered substrate, which in turn means an unhindered leaving group. And so our leaving group can be methyl. I'm sorry, our leaving group can be attached to methyl a primary carbon or a secondary carbon only. Okay? No tertiary, no neopental. The other factor is that we want a solvent that is polar aprotic. And that meant no OH or no NH. And then we want a strong nucleophile or a good nucleophile. And you are given a table of nucleophiles, and you will have that table on the test. But you should also realize what makes a good nucleophile a good nucleophile and be able to argue differences. And remember, we wanted the negative charge. We wanted it to be basic. And this related to pKa arguments of the conjugate acid and we want it to be polarizable. So the larger size is a better nucleophile. So these three things are key to having a fast SN2 reaction. Now that we see the picture for SN2, let's talk about SN1 and go through the same reasoning. So just how we characterize SN2 for SN1, it is now stepwise. It occurs over three steps. It is called unimolecular, meaning one molecule is in the slow step that determines the rate, and it is first order. So let's do an example SN1 reaction. And so we have ROH 
and in this case, this is our nucleophile, which is oftentimes our solvent. And then we're going to use the same alkyl halide from before. And remember that this was secondary, and we're going to have solvent and often heat, and heat will be shown as delta. Again, we're going to discuss the mechanism. And so if you look back at our SN2 reaction, for SN2, the mechanism was two arrows. We only needed two red arrows for that reaction. In this case, our mechanism is four arrows. In the first step, our leaving group leaves with the help of the heat and the help of the solvent. And this is going to form a carbocation. A carbocation is our intermediate and it is planar at this carbon and it is sp2. Don't forget that there is an H attached here that I'm not showing, and the H is still attached here as well. Because it's planar, when the nucleophile attacks, it can attack from the front face or from the back. So let me show just one of those attack. Okay, so the alcohol or whatever your solvent is can attack. Using one lone pair to attack, you have one lone pair left over and a plus charge. And at this point, another molecule of solvent can come in and remove the hydrogen in a deprotonation to form a neutral molecule. So I'm not showing either face of attack here, but if this attacked from the front face, then this would be a wedge. But it can also attack from the back face. And so not only do you form this, but separately, and I will show this in green, attack from the back face and I'm going to draw this as a dotted line. And both of these pathways start from the carbocation. So if I attack from the back, I go through the same second intermediate which then is deprotonated by a second molecule of solvent. and to give me product. In both cases, I have a byproduct that I did not draw, and that is the solvent that has an extra hydrogen on it. So it is the protonated solvent in both cases. And I also forgot to draw my leaving group back here, so when the leaving group left, it is now floating around in solution. So I have these two pathways going on to form two different products. Keep in mind that I'm saying there's four mechanism arrows to lead to one of the products. So one, two, three, four gives one product. One, two, three, four could give the second product. And the relationship between these products is important. You want to focus on the stereo center. So where your leaving group was attached, your stereocenter is now racemized. So the stereocenter is racemized. This is not the case for SN2. In SN2, our stereocenter was inverted only. 
And I also want to point out that when your nucleophile or solvent attacks from the same face as your leaving group, we call this retention. And when it's opposite the leaving group, we call this inversion. So this is an SN1 reaction that occurs over three steps. Step one, step two, and step three. And step one is our slow step. And step one equals our rate determining step. And from before, we said the rate determining step is what determines the rate law. So the only thing involved is the leaving group leaving from the substrate. Okay, so our rate law in this case is K times the concentration of substrate. That's different than SN2. The nucleophile is not involved here. Okay. If I double the concentration of substrate, I will double my rate. If I double the concentration of nucleophile, nothing will happen because nucleophile is not in this rate law. So let's look at the energy diagram for this reaction, for an SN1 reaction. And it is three steps. So I need to represent that in my energy diagram. So you still have energy on your y-axis and reaction coordinate on the x-axis, and your first step is your slow step. You have reactants on the left, products on the right. You have intermediate 1 and intermediate 2, and then you have transition state 1, transition state 2, and transition state 3. The highest energy barrier is from reactants to transition state 1. As you can see, this is higher than this barrier and, then, and also compared to this barrier. And so that's delta G of the um, free energy of activation to get to the product. So your first step is your slow step because this is the largest. So even though you have two other transition states, they do not determine the rate of the reaction. So a few other notes. Um, to, de to increase the rate of an SN1 reaction, again, you want to lower this transition state en energy. If you can lower this energy, you'll get a faster rate. So just like we did for SN2, let's say, how can we have a faster rate for SN1? And in this case, we do want a hindered substrate. And so we want secondary or tertiary leaving group. We want a weak nucleophile. Or we want the solvent to be the nucleophile. We want a polar protic solvent. And polar protic means that you do have an OH or an NH, and we often have heat in these reactions. Looking at both SN1 and SN2, delta S is not a factor in either SN1 or SN2. And there was one last aspect that we talked about with energy diagrams and rates, and that was the Hammond postulate. So let me erase this. The Hammond postulate. This can be said for any reaction, and the topic is just introduced in this chapter. And this tells us that the transition state of an exothermic step so an exothermic step means you release energy. The transition state is closer in energy to the reactants. So TS closer to reactants.
reactions. This is what happens in an SN2 reaction. It is one step that's exothermic. The Hammond postulate also says that the TS of an endothermic step So for endothermic, you're uphill. Okay. The transition state is closer in energy to product. And this is what happens in SN1 for the first step. So if you go back and look at the SN1 um, reaction picture, you'll see that the energy diagram is uphill for the first step. And so we can discuss the Hammond postulate in relation to these two reactions. Okay? And keep in mind that if you lower the transition state energy in either case, you get a faster reaction. And that's why we talked about what's favored in both cases. Okay. So keep in mind that this summary is just for you to have all the key points on paper. And you need to go back through and probably write more complete notes about each of these with full definitions and do a lot of practice problems.